So my name is Chaz Emmerich. Um, uh, some of you may have uh, seen my name or my handle floating around the Clojure community for a while. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, so today I uh, wanted to talk with you about something that's uh, uh, sort of on the surface a little mundane perhaps, uh, but it's uh, I often find myself uh, dealing with these sorts of bits of plumbing, uh, and this one in particular uh, proved to be uh, a uh, particularly challenging bit of plumbing, uh, but one that I think has uh, turned out to be um, produced a very positive outcome. Um, so what we're talking about is targeting uh, closure and closure script uh, from a single code base. Uh, and generally, people refer to that as portability. Uh, I'm sort of going to use that term, although I think there's, there's a lot that's wrapped up in the term portability that uh, uh, I'm not going to speak about here necessarily. Uh, so just forgive that sort of semantic uh, uh, shorthand. Uh, but before we get into the how, uh, for a second I just want to back up and, and, and talk about why you would want to do this. Uh, and this may be obvious to many of you, but to many people it's not. Uh, so the, so you know, the common trope about why you would want to have a single language, and obviously closure and closure script are not the same language, but people see parens and like to conflate things. Um, but, the, but, but, a, but a typical trope is that you want to have a, a common set of validation routines on the client side and the server side. And while that's sort of true, I think that's a really horrible uh, uh, use case to provide as a motivating example of why you would want to have a degree of portability between uh, uh, your, your, your code targeting uh, two different execution environments. Um, in particular, uh, compared to uh, uh, Clojure, uh, you, you know, Clojure script targets the JavaScript uh, uh, language. and JavaScript environments these days are completely usable as a general purpose uh, a computation medium. Uh, so what this means is that you can deploy ClojureScript server side in Node.js, for example, and Node.js was founded on the principle that JavaScript is a reasonable language to build arbitrary computations upon, and there's a large set of libraries that allow you to do all the sorts of things that you might do in uh, Clojure and on the JVM using servlets, for example, and all the libraries that come along with that and do it uh, on the server instead using a JavaScript uh, uh, runtime and in our case, closure script. Um, but beyond that, uh, you know, client-side applications uh, targeting browsers uh, now have at their disposal a wide array of facilities that just five years ago simply could not be fathomed. That everything from uh, far more advanced uh, accelerated graphics uh, options to uh, d uh, database and uh, storage options that uh, really are roughly equivalent in uh, power to uh, those that you might find on, on the server side. Um, and at the end of the day, JavaScript environments can go where the JVM can't. Uh, and so if you like the abstractions and the leverage and the power that, job, that uh, Clojure provides, uh, but you do need to be in some environment where you can't ship a JVM or where you do want to take advantage of some of the unique characteristics of certain JavaScript environments like the browsers, um, then you really do want to have uh, a certain amount of, of efficiency targeting both your back-end systems and you know, those, those distributed client-side environments that, that you need to reach. Um, so now why do we need to think about a solution for portability at all, right? Uh, I sort of said flippantly that once people see parens, uh, they, they assume that things will just sort of work out naturally. Uh, obviously, maybe not obviously, that's not true, uh, but to understand where the uh, differences between Clojure and ClojureScript cropped up, uh, you have to understand to a certain degree the history of ClojureScript. So the first uh, commit on the project was three years after uh, Clojure became public. And uh, the effect of that is that uh, it was built uh, with the benefit of all the experience that Rich and everyone else in the Clojure community had gained over those years in building Clojure, using it, and uh, really uh, sort of coming to grips with uh, 
the strengths of it as well as some of the weaknesses that you know, one might want to address in a new language that had the same kind of syntax, uh, 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 semantics, and leverage that uh, Clojure has. So for example, ClojureScript assumes that protocols are available, whereas protocols and Clojure only landed, I think, in 1.3. Uh, and uh, this, this means that uh, there's a simpler, easier set of base abstractions that you have available for use in ClojureScript compared to Clojure, which relies on uh, a, a host construct, Java interfaces, to provide that, those, those base set of abstractions. Um, also, in the, in the process of building ClojureScript, uh, portability was uh, almost explicitly not an objective. Uh, from the beginning, Clojure has been characterized as a hosted language, and what that means is, is that the host is uh, not hidden. It is all of the facilities that it provides that are useful are used as is within uh, the higher level language, either Clojure or ClojureScript. Uh, and this means, for example, that uh, you don't use a Clojure string uh, on the JVM, you use Java strings, and likewise for, for uh, JavaScript. Um, but in the process of, because portability was not an objective, in the process of sort of refining the, those base abstractions, for example, through the protocols, there's a whole bunch of sort of off by one naming differences, uh, which, uh, you know, if you're moving from Clojure to Clojure Script, it's very straightforward to, you know, find a corollary function in the core namespace or to identify uh, uh, protocols in Clojure Script that correspond to the Java interfaces uh, in, in Clojure. Uh, but if you're trying to build a single code base that targets both environments, uh, this is sort of the very first thing that you run into, especially when doing uh, maybe more uh, sophisticated things like uh, uh, providing protocol implementations for custom types and things like that. Um, aside from the, the, the naming uh, uh, question, there are some very material differences between Clojure and ClojureScript. Uh, one that people, uh, are sort of confronted with immediately, although perhaps they aren't sure uh, why, why things worked out the way they did, is that ClojureScript has a hybrid compilation model. Uh, what that means is that the macros that are used, uh, uh, that, that you use, including things as simple as uh, if let, for example, those are written in Clojure and macro expanded in Clojure uh, prior to the actual closure script emitter uh, uh, getting, getting a hold of them at all. Um, and because there's these uh, sort of dueling namespaces, in your, name, in your NS declaration, you actually need to bring those macros in using a different, uh, different directive, essentially. Uh, and so this is, this is one thing that, that people sort of butt up against immediately, whereas uh, if you put, you know, require macros or use macros in a closure script file, even if all the names are exactly the same, you can't load that in Clojure. Uh, closure script doesn't have any runtime namespaces, and so that can be an issue depending on what you're, what you're doing in, in, uh, in uh, detail. Uh, and then, of course, again, it's a hosted language, just like Clojure, and so there are, uh, there's all the issues and baggage that come along with targeting the JavaScript host. Uh, that means there's a bunch of missing primitives, in particular uh, numerics and things that aren't primitives in Java, but we sort of like to treat them as such, like the arbitrary precision numerics. Um, there's, a, there's a less capable execution model. Uh, in this, I'm largely referring to the fact that JavaScript is single-threaded uh, fundamentally, uh, although there are some other details that you end up bumping into. Uh, and then, you know, all the other things uh, that uh, JavaScript provides in its uh, good graces. So we need to work around all these things. And so uh, if you are convinced of the uh, benefits or necessity of targeting uh, these two uh, uh, platforms uh, with, the same, with, with the same code base, then you need to have a way to address them. Uh, of course, you could just not address them within a single code base. And, have one code base for Clojure and one code base for ClojureScript. Uh, and people do this, uh, it, it works. Uh, there's obviously a cost associated with this. Uh, so for example, uh, you know, some, of the, some of the most popular uh, nearly language level libraries like Core Async take this approach where uh, they really are working with the host environment uh, very directly. Uh, and so there's uh, perhaps uh, not as much 
shared code that you might want to deploy to JVM Closure versus Closure Script. Uh, but there's a, there's, a, there's a resource tool there, and personally, since I am largely working on my own or with a very small set of uh, uh, collaborators and, and contributors, having two separate code bases uh, is sort of infeasible in terms of uh, just the economics of things. Um, you could carefully keep portable and non-portable code separate, right? Uh, and this is a typical pattern where you might have uh, the implementation detail uh, bits for each uh, target platform in a separate namespace, and then a common API that uh, refers to each depending on some, some runtime flag or some uh, 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 flag that you provide in the course of compilation. Um, and this basically works, but the problem is that when building real applications, as soon as you need to do something that is hosty or otherwise non-portable, uh, you end up having to restructure your application and library uh, to avoid having that hosty or non-portable call in your portable namespace. And so you end up having this sort of proliferation of namespaces that are being created strictly to satisfy uh, the uh, uh, portability concerns as opposed to focusing on the domain that you care about. Um, and if you manage to avoid doing that, you end up having sort of like a lowest common denominator uh, uh, code base where you are, where you're not taking advantage of uh, the things that your target environments offer. Uh, and this can have implications both for performance and for functionality. Um, there, one of the earliest uh, options for addressing portability in the closure script world were these things called crossovers uh, in uh, line CLJS build. And what crossovers were would sort of handle the require macros and use macros uh, declaration differences and assume that you're writing sort of portable, uh, perhaps lowest common denominator code and copy them, copy that file from its .clj position to the same corresponding uh, uh, file name with a .cljs swapping out that use and require macros bit. Um, this worked for some uh, people in some areas. Uh, uh, since I've uh, started maintaining line CLJS build and given my work in other areas, uh, I've, I've sort of declared that this is deprecated and should not be used. It was a severe and clever hack to begin with, but it's not something I think that we should be using anymore. Um, so the final option that I'm going to talk about is that you write code once. You do have a single unified code base that targets these very divergent uh, uh, execution and, and, and deployment environments. And then you translate that single code base as necessary to uh, uh, cope with the target environment's differences on either side. Um, and this is called preprocessing in other areas. So if anyone has ever done any C or C++ programming, uh, you should be very familiar with the uh, C preprocessor and other preprocessor systems. And they are very straightforward. You have a set of source files that represents your single unified code base that you have written to hopefully target multiple uh, runtimes or execution environments. You have a compilation environment that sort of describes uh, which uh, which target you are compiling for. You have the actual preprocessor, which takes in that environment and your source files, produces uh, a set of environment-specific source files that suit the uh, uh, target runtime, and then those go on to your actual compiler to do the work of compiling for that target environment. Uh, and so, you know, there are, there's plenty of examples to see what, what uh, C preprocessor macros look like. Um, and this works. It's the way things have worked in, in, in terms of writing portable code bases in uh, uh, other environments for uh, decades. Uh, and there's certainly a trade-off here in terms of uh, the sort of real estate that you need to accommodate uh, uh, these portability directives. Uh, but at the same time, there's also a benefit that when you are going through and maintaining a portable code base, you're not looking for an implementation of a function in five different files if you have five different uh, uh, target environments. There's a, there's a, uh, a benefit in terms of uh, keeping portable code together uh, so that you can address issues and bugs across all your environments very readily within the same uh, 
within the same frame, essentially. Um, the corresponding concept is called feature expressions. Uh, this is something that's existed in Common Lisp and other Lisp implementations uh, for near on 30 years, I think. Uh, and this is an example pulled from the uh, Common Lisp hyperspec uh, where you have a set of features. Uh, the Lispm, Spice uh, uh, symbols here identify features that might be found in a runtime list in, in, in a Common Lisp case. Uh, of different features that are available, and when the compiler sees this form, it uses uh, the uh, hash plus or hash minus uh, uh, forms to uh, look up the named symbol, and if it's present, then the annotated uh, form within the expression is spliced in. If it's not, then it's removed. And Common Lisp also has uh, uh, support for uh, uh, conjunctions and disjunctions of these symbols, which this third example uh, shows. So if you type this uh, expression into a common Lisp compiler or interpreter uh, and define these, uh, these, these feature symbols as described here, then you'll have totally different uh, forms that are being compiled. So now CLJX, uh, getting it into the meat of things, is a uh, library and lining and plugin uh, that implements feature expressions for closure and closure script. Uh, and it's a fairly faithful uh, implementation of this. So it operates entirely outside of the reading macro expansion and compilation of closure script. Uh, this is important and I'll show you why uh, once we start looking at a couple of, of examples because even reading closure code uh, implies that you are within a runtime that does things like uh, alias uh, uh, namespace keyword resolution and things like that. So you really do need to be performing this uh, uh, feature expression transformation prior to any closure or closure script uh, uh, component or compiler even looking at the code. Uh, second, a key, uh, sorry, uh, so, the, so, the, so the transformation rules are applied to a lossless representation of your code. Uh, so if you've played with the reader at all, you'll know that when you read in uh, some closure code, you sort of lose a lot of uh, uh, meta information that we all find important, it's like the formatting, comments, that sort of thing. So if you read in an expression and then print it out using PR or something like that, you lose, again, formatting and comments. Uh, CLJX uses the uh, uh, S-Jacket library from Christoph Grand, uh, who's been helped quite a bit uh, in, in recent months and years by uh, Colin Jones in, in maintaining that. Uh, and so what that does is it ensures that uh, when the CLJX transformation occurs, you don't lose the comments, line numbers, column numbers of the code that is being actually being passed on to the closure and closure script compiler. And one of the most important parts here is that uh, when you use CLJX, you use it, you see it, but your downstream dependents do not. So this means that you can use CLJX to write a portable closure and closure script library, and the people that use that library never have to know that you use CLJX at all. So when you jar up the result of CLJX's transformation, there's no .CLJX file, it's just closure files and closure script files, and those can be consumed downstream by anyone without touching or even knowing about CLJX. Uh, and I said, as I said, it's, uh, it, it provides a lining and plugin, which we'll see in a second, and also has integration with NREPL. Uh, and its, its process looks exactly analogous to uh, other preprocessors like the, like the C preprocessor. We have .CLJX sources, uh, it's critical to use that separate uh, file extension because that's how uh, CLJX identifies CLJX code. You have uh, configuration and or uh, a, a session type on your uh, NREPL connection. That's all managed by CLJX and that sort of defines whether you're targeting closure or closure script. CLJX uses that information and your sources to produce closure or closure script sources, or both, depending on certain bits of configuration, and those are passed on to the closure and closure script compiler entirely separately. 
Uh, and so now to start taking a look at what this uh, looks and feels like in practice, uh, this is the NS declaration from a CLJX library that I maintain called PPRNG. It's a portable, seedable, random number generator uh, uh, API for closure and closure script. Uh, necessary because uh, the default random number generator in JavaScript uh, does, is, is not seedable. Uh, I needed this because of uh, my, my need to use uh, property-based testing. At the time, uh, uh, read Draper simple check, now test check. Uh, I, I produced a uh, closure script fork of it. Uh, it's actually portable closure and closure script uh, uh, a simple check called double check. And this is one of the components that I needed, a, a, a seedable random number generator so that I could rerun failed property-based tests uh, in JavaScript uh, given the seed that was used to start the random data generation. So we see here there's uh, directives, the hash plus CLJ and CLJS. These correspond exactly with the common list feature symbols that we saw earlier. Uh, and they're an you can use these to annotate any form. So in this case, uh, they're, they're only annotating uh, lists here. Uh, the require, require, and import list within the, the namespace declaration. But you can uh, prefix any symbol, keyword, list, vector, map, any form in closure and closure script with one of these uh, uh, annotations in order to identify whether they should be included or not included given the, uh, given the configuration of your environment. So, when you transform that input target enclosure, it's going to, we're going to bounce back and forth, you can see very clearly, uh, it's, uh, I mislabeled the slide, this is target enclosure script. So it's, uh, so it's stripping out the forms that are labeled as target enclosure and leaving only those that uh, uh, target closure script. And likewise, when targeting closure, uh, it, it reveals uh, the obverse. And now, uh, notice that the uh, uh, line number positioning remains the same. This is critical in maintaining a correspondence between uh, the line numbers uh, reported in stack traces, for example, uh, and the original source forms. So this means that when a downstream user of yours gets a stack trace and they do a you know, navigate to definition based on a, uh, a file name and line number, they're actually going to land where that exception was thrown uh, as opposed to where it was thrown from a potentially mangled uh, uh, set of sources that were produced by a transformation that doesn't do this kind of line and column number preservation. So knowing this, uh, let's, let's take a look at an example here. Um, I'm just going to demonstrate uh, how you use CLJX. Let's make this. From line again, um, it's just another task that you run, very similar to line CLJS build. Uh, if you're using this in the pipeline that uh, includes closure script compilation, then you would just add, you know, comma CLJS build once or test or whatever whatever your objective is. Uh, CLJX is going to find all of your uh, CLJX resources, transform them based on your configuration, uh, and put them where you tell it to put them. And so here's what it produces. Uh, on the left here, we have the original input file, the CLJX file that implements the uh, seedable, portable, random number generator. And on the right is the closure script uh, output of CLJX. And so you can see that all the line numbers uh, uh, correspond properly. It's stripping out all the uh, bits of code that are annotated as uh, being uh, annotated as, as uh, target enclosure, and you're left with a closure script file that you can pass along to any tooling that expects a closure script file, including the compiler. And likewise for the, uh, for the, for the, for the closure side of things. Um, Right, so that's pretty straightforward. And what I also want to show is something that I'm particularly happy about. 
what you might imagine is that since this is a, from what you've seen so far, a lining and plugin that integrates with that sort of workflow on the command line, is that it's just working with files on disk. Uh, so it takes a CLJX file, produces closure and closure script files, and then the respective compilers pick them up on the other side. Uh, that workflow is fine, but uh, I like REPLs. I assume you like REPLs. Uh, and so I certainly don't want to uh, constrain your use of CLJX uh, to when you're running lining in tasks, for example. Uh, and so I managed to uh, integrate uh, CLJX into NREPL uh, using some NREPL middleware. Uh, and very straightforwardly, what we want to do is load and eval CLJX code just the same way that we eval closure and closure script code when we have a closure or closure script REPL open. Um, and further, we want to not just be able to provide CLJX code to be loaded and evaluated, we want to require namespaces that happen to have been, uh, happen to be implemented using CLJX locally without running that CLJX trans, uh, transformation ahead of time. Um, and so this, is, this has been done and uh, works well using a, a piece of NREPL middleware uh, that hooks closure core load and uh, the corresponding uh, function in the closure script compiler. Uh, and this is safer than it sounds. Uh, uh, there's, there's a little bit of sleight of hand here, uh, but, the, but, the, but the functions being modified here haven't actually uh, changed in closure since version 1.3. Uh, and so swapping in our own, re our own implementation of these uh, from CLJX is reasonably safe uh, and uh, similar caveats apply uh, or a, a, a similar situation holds with uh, ClojureScript. So going back to our example here. Uh, so I already did a clean and uh, uh, just, to, just to show there's nothing on my sleeve here, um, there's no closure sources here. There's the CMRIC PPRNG CLJX file, but no closure. So I'm in my uh, closure REPL, but I can still require, oh, right. That's bizarre. Thank you. Now I'm hoping that the uh, demo gods don't kill me. And they are killing me. Oh, that's why. Excuse me momentarily. I, uh, this, this PPRNG project has actually been stable for quite a while. So the, uh, so the NREPL support, uh, it was using an old version of CLJX. works. So now I can load, thank you. Um, so it's a, that's, a, that's a reasonably recent feature. Uh, the uh, addition uh, to support loading uh, CLJX code in closure REPLs was added, I think, in uh, version 0.3.2. Uh, the support for the closure script side of things is actually only on the most recent snapshot. That's something that I very recently put together. Um, and so this works, this works very well. And so my work for the past uh, probably year or so has been focused entirely on, on, on building a uh, set of libraries and an application that are uh, sort, of, sort of aggressively, um, sort of 
sort of aggressively portable. And I have a feeling that Impress has crashed. It has. Does anyone know what that process name is? Okay, excuse me. So, uh, yes, yeah, so the, so the uh, NREPL middleware uh, support works. It's safer than it sounds. I've been using it personally for uh, probably the past three months or so. Uh, and again, uh, working on a set of libraries and applications that are sort of aggressively, uh, uh, cross, or, uh, aggressively portable between Clojure and ClojureScript. Uh, and it's actually uh, been started to be used uh, fairly widely as these things go in the community. Uh, a couple of uh, very well-known libraries, including Prismatic Schema, use CLJX and are written entirely in CLJX so that they can be used both in Clojure and ClojureScript. Um, and so just to close, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the shortcomings of this approach and uh, maybe some of the sort of unexplored opportunities that it, that it offers. Uh, one thing is that uh, CLJX does not have any, uh, uh, does not provide any story uh, in terms of uh, writing portable macros. So as I was saying before, there's a hybrid compilation process going on here where when you're targeting ClojureScript, your macros are implemented in and executed within Clojure. Um, and so if you are writing a macro that you want to be able to use from both Clojure and ClojureScript, you need to emit code from that macro that is targeting Clojure and ClojureScript respectively. Um, CLJX does not say anything about this. It's not looking at your macro files, which are necessarily Clojure, uh, and so you need to handle that aspect of portability on your own using uh, the uh, environment provided to your macro, for example, to detect whether you're in Clojure or ClojureScript and then do a straightforward switch. Um, in real applications, if you are not sort of strategic about your use of the, the hash plus or minus uh, uh, annotations, you can go a little uh, crazy with them depending on uh, the granularity of portability that you're implementing and get a fair bit of line noise. So uh, what I generally do is I uh, use the uh, uh, preprocessor, essentially, annotations uh, in ways that uh, minimize this. Uh, it can get pretty rough, especially when you are implementing a set of protocol uh, methods for a type, uh, just because you really do need to interleave uh, names of protocols or interfaces and their implementation. Uh, but that's, this, is, this is sort of just the cost of doing business in this area. Uh, in terms of opportunities, uh, the feature expression facility that CLJX provides uh, uh, has a good deal of flexibility, and there is a provision for providing your own custom transformations of code at this level. Uh, and so it's possible to, if you were so ambitious, to provide a, um, an implicit renaming set of rules such that, for example, uh, you know, uh, corresponding protocol and interface names could be rewritten automatically without any annotations whatsoever. Um, I'm not going to recommend that you do this uh, uh, or, or similar things using the uh, transformation rule flexibility that's available, but it is there and um, uh, probably should be used with caution and restraint, uh, but it is there if you need it. 
And then something that I've only thought about and not worked on at all is that uh, I'm, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the uh, hash racket uh, uh, facilities in the racket language and the power and flexibility that provides to uh, implement uh, new types of syntax within Racket. Uh, but I believe that uh, CLJX, perhaps with a couple of tweaks, could be used to provide this same uh, level of uh, control and flexibility uh, for us in the closure sphere. Uh, and that's something that I might tinker here and there with. So that's all I wanted to talk with you about today. I appreciate your uh, patience and understanding with my slight technical foibles. Uh, but there's a, here's a couple of resources for you, obviously CLJX. Uh, there has been discussion among some people about the feasibility of rolling feature expressions into Clojure and ClojureScript as a native language feature, which would uh, remove the need for something like the CLJX uh, library and plugin. Um, there's a discussion with a number of people, although I don't think anyone uh, sort of from an authoritative standpoint on, on the topic. Uh, and for those interested in history, there's the uh, common list hyperspec that describes uh, what feature expressions look and behave like uh, in languages of days of yore. So I'll take uh, any questions if there's, I think I can take like two questions now, if anyone has one. Uh, the question is, uh, do I see any, uh, any way that macros could be written portably for Clojure and Clojure script? Um, there are ways, um, they are not pretty, both from a sort of usage and workflow standpoint as well as from an implementation standpoint. Um, I, think, uh, I think the real, the real hope is that the ClojureScript compiler ends up eventually, sometime hopefully soon, uh, being able to run in JavaScript as well, and that would allow you to uh, have the same compilation mode, uh, model within ClojureScript as you do in Clojure. Uh, that's my hope. I'd rather not try and skin that cat because it's actually fairly, fair, uh, fairly gnarly. Any other? Yeah. In terms of motivation, uh, you didn't mention this, but you know the middle uh, drain of having to, to work with uh, code that looks similar but is not exactly the same is a problem that causes errors and confusion. Um, and the other thing is I've been thinking that it would be really nice to, to find, you know, however many dozen things people do extremely commonly, common idioms in, in, in Clojure and Clojure script, like printing out a line of text or something in open file and, uh, and, and put in convenient functions for those. That could be implemented in CLJ actually just with a regular library. Yeah, so the, so the question is about, um, you know, is there any you know, thought or plan or approach to sort of addressing uh, common use cases? Uh, for example, you know, printing, to, uh, printing out text to the you know, appropriate console and, and, and things like that so that we could obviate the need for uh, annotating the, those ourselves within our portable code bases. Um, you know, going back to the notion that uh, uh, Clojure and ClojureScript are hosted, um, I mean, it's there are always going to be other things that aren't going to be portable. I sort of think of this as a typical 80-20 problem where everyone's 80% is different, right? Um, and so there are certain, there's, there's certainly uh, room for someone to build sets of libraries using something like CLJX to provide these kinds of uh, wrappers or uh, higher level abstractions uh, that are portable between Clojure and ClojureScript. And uh, if that's something that people in the community want to do, then, then by all means, the tools are certainly available. Um, I think it's probably going to be a, uh, a tough thing to do in any kind of general sense. And so, yeah. Any, yeah, one more. Sorry, what? Uh, so the question is whether I use double check uh, for uh, testing CLJX itself or code bases that use CLJX. Oh, that uh, use CLJX. Uh, yeah, so uh, nearly all of the uh, libraries and applications that I've been working on for many, many months uh, are all written in CLJX. And uh, ever since uh, I got the property-based uh, testing religion, uh, thanks to Reed um, and 
you know, sort of just did the work to make it so that I had a portable property testing uh, tool, which is double check in Clojure and ClojureScript. Yeah, I, I use it extensively, and uh, I, I can't imagine doing testing any other way at this point, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you very much, I appreciate it.